very much. Um, I just wanted to start by, by thanking, um, uh, saying it's a pleasure to be here, and actually want to take just a second to thank uh, all the organizers, especially Alex Pico, who spent, uh, Dr. Alex Pico, who spent a lot of uh, time uh, organizing this workshop and uh, with, the, with the other organizing committees. So I just want to thank them um, before we get started. Okay, um, my lab at the University of Toronto uh, focuses on sort of one main concept. Uh, the general idea and kind of a computer science general generalization is that we're trying to understand causal models from big data, and in biology that generally means pathways from genomics or any kind of omics data. Um, and typically, um, you know, we, we want to use these causal models to explain the relationship between genotype to phenotype, so can we predict phenotype based on genotype. Uh, we have a lot of information about genotype from whole genome sequencing. We have a lot of information about phenotype at molecular levels and physiological levels and uh, clinical levels. Um, typically, uh, a lot of genomics type research uh, treats this data using a correlation based um, analysis. So the, the most common one is genome wide analysis uh, 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 association studies or GWAS. So GWAS seeks to for instance, uh, um, find SNPs that are associated with uh, a phenotype. Um, and it might predict that those are causal, but it's not necessarily causal. You actually usually have to do a huge amount of work to determine if those, if those relationships are causal. Um, however, we know that, um, I think most people in this room um, are on board with this idea, but we know that there's a lot of mechanism, we know a lot about mechanisms in the cell that actually read the genome and create the phenotype, and so ideally we would be able to use that and improve the, um, the general understanding. So, you know, just a, a couple of um, simple examples. Um, uh, uh, for instance, if you have a genome-wide association study and you um, have 10, 10 individuals, 10 cases uh, that have a phenotype, uh, 10 controls that don't have a phenotype, um, each of the individual cases um, has a SNP and mutation. Um, if they're, you know, in, in a genome-wide association study, you want to look for the ideal signal is uh, a single mutation present in all the cases and not present in any of the controls, but it never really works out that way. Usually it's more like each case has a different mutation. Um, and uh, basically there's nothing you can do with that in a genome-wide association study. However, if you know that all the SNPs affect genes in the same pathway and you do the association at the pathway level, then you can say this pathway is significantly associated with the phenotype. And so you've gone from a situation where you have no signal to a a perfect signal just by using prior knowledge that these genes are in a set called a pathway. Um, similarly, you can do that at, you know, with gene expression data. Um, if you have a thousand genes that are differentially expressed, you can say, you know, what explains this pattern that I see? Well, it might be a transcription factor using prior knowledge of transcription factor target interaction. And so that can help explain uh, phenotype data. So in general, my lab is just focused on different ways of creatively combining prior knowledge, any kind of information about cellular mechanisms, pathways, networks, um, reactions, uh, and genomics data to try and um, get more information about mechanism at, in, in individual, um, uh, in individual uh, contexts, and specifically disease. So I don't have to, um, so this just summarizes the kind of benefits of using pathways and networks, which I think most people in the room know about. Um, uh, I also just want to mention that um, as part of the National Resource for Network Biology, which Alex mentioned earlier, it's led by Trey Eidecker and Alex, and uh, Chris Sander also participates. A number of people um, in, uh, that are participating in that are, are at this conference as well. Um, fo uh, focuses on, um, you know, trying to use m this network information or cell mechanism information um, in uh, kind of three major themes, differential, predictive and multi-scale. So um, differential is just comparing them. Predictive is uh, actually, I'll focus on that today. And multi-scale is, uh, you know, considering molecules, cells, um, or atoms, as we saw earlier, uh, at, at different scales. And it's great to see the talks that were in this um, workshop today, uh, addressing all of these things in different ways and growing outwards from the kind of standard network analysis that we saw a long time ago, which is just protein interaction networks. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a very old concept, pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, this was, as far as I can tell, um, developed in a paper uh, in Nature Genetics um, from George Church's lab in 1999. Um, everyone uses 
uh, enrichment analysis, gene ontology enrichment analysis, gene set enrichment analysis to uh, better understand gene lists. Um, um, this is an excellent idea, as, as everybody, everybody knows. Um, I just wanted to um, highlight that uh, just viewing the results as a list is uh, challenging to kind of identify major themes and interpret. So one of the things that, um, that uh, uh, and this is mostly by way of introduction because we'll be using this later in the talk, one of the things that we developed a few years ago, Danielle Americo and Ruth Isserlin in my lab, along with uh, Andrew Emili, um, developed this uh, visualization method where we use networks to visualize the results of enrichment maps. And in this case, the network nodes are pathways or gene sets. Uh, the color of the node represents the score of how enriched a pathway is uh, in a gene list. Uh, the size of the node represents the uh, number of genes in the gene set. And connections represent crosstalk or overlap between the gene sets. So we, know, we all know that the pathway uh, that the gene ontology enrichment analysis methods that we use, uh, that use gene ontology, the gene ontology terms are highly overlapping. In fact, they're in this hierarchy. Um, there's a lot of subset relationships. Uh, this type of visualization can help organize all of the results into uh, major themes um, that bring all of the similar pathways or gene sets together. Um, and so we can see, um, I don't know if you can uh, see this pointer here, um, you can see uh, you know, this is the RNA transport theme. There's a bunch of pathways that are, uh, that are part of that theme, um, but they all get automatically summarized by this enrichment map analysis. You can sort of zoom in here and see the actual names of the, um, of the, uh, the pathways. So this is a generalized method for any kind of visualization. Uh, it's a network-based visualization for any kind of enrichment analysis method. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, I think it's uh, methods like this method and methods like it, another one is Klugo, um, are things that I think we should, be, we should be using whenever we visualize the results of enrichment analysis. Um, you can also use it to, uh, as I said, try to infer more causal um, ex explanations. Here's an example where we took gene expression data, uh, differential gene expression data, made an enrichment map, um, and then uh, we also looked at, we, we also tried to predict uh, transcription factors that were important in that gene expression data, in this case using the opossum tool from Wyeth Wasserman's lab. And, um, and then we could represent the transcription factor targets uh, as another node in this network, another set, and we can see how um, there's overlap between that transcription factor targets and various pathways, but not all pathways. So certain pathways we then would predict are, are, are regulated by this transcription factor and other ones not. And so that, again, helps gain additional mechanistic information from, from this data. So the best example where we've uh, used, been able to use this very simple idea of pathway enrichment analysis to uh, uh, make predictions and, and better understand uh, something important clinically is with a, a project on a pneumoma with a colleague of mine, Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. He studies, among other things, uh, pneumoma. It's a uh, the third most common brain tumor in children. It affects the ependymum, which is the lining of the central nervous system. Uh, for many years, people had understood that depending on where this tumor appears in the brain anatomically, you get different outcomes. And the most serious outcome uh, occurs when it, the, the tumor grows in the posterior fossa, which is the back of the brain, the, the brain stem and the cerebellum. Um, and uh, so based on this knowledge of anatomical location, uh, surgeons would make des decide treatment, and the, the, because this is the most serious one, they'd immediately uh, apply serious radiation treatment and surgery to remove the tumor. Unfortunately, um, th that's the only treatment available. There are no drugs for this this tumor, and that tumor that treatment is very devastating. Just imagine a pediatric case could be a baby uh, re re receiving brain surgery and radiation, and there's large long term, basically lifetime effects of, of that kind of. Uh, treatment, so they really want to avoid it if possible. Um, a few years ago, uh, Michael Taylor uh, uh, collected a number of samples and lo looking at gene expression data, found that there were two natural subtypes of this serious posterior fossa uh, tumor. One affected the youngest patients and had a terrible outcome, and one affected the oldest patients and had an excellent outcome. So even though people previously had lumped everything together as posterior fossa, bad outcome. Turns out that there are two types. One has a terrible outcome, and that's where all the bad outcome signal came from. One has an excellent outcome, and maybe shouldn't be uh, giving a serious uh, treatment for those, for those subtypes, and that's 
uh, something that Michael's lab is following up on. So Michael wanted to follow further look into this and did a whole bunch of genome sequencing, exome sequencing, um, found no mutations. So basically the first time that this has happened in cancer genomics, I think there were, you know, on average the samples had like two or three mutations after filtering germline variants, um, no recurrent mutations. Cancer is supposed to be a, 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 a disease of uh, genome instability. It's one of the hallmarks of cancer. In this particular tumor, genome instability does not seem to play a role, um, at least at this stage. One of the reasons might be that it's a pediatric tumor. We know that as you age, you get more mutations, so the muta frequency of mutations is correlated with age. Um, so that might be one, one reason. Uh, but it doesn't, unfortunately, explain any, get, provide any insight into the mechanism of, the, of this disease. Um, fortunately, he tried then next looking at DNA methylation and um, using CPG island promoter methylation focused uh, analysis, found that there were uh, methylation data easily subset these two uh, classes. And so pointed at an epigenetic mechanism for this. Um, the analysis generated 2,000 differentially methylated genes where the um, posterior fossa A, the, the serious one, had a lot more methylation at uh, about these 2,000 promoter regions. So we assume that um, those about 2,000 genes are more silenced in this uh, um, serious subtype. Um, standard pathway analysis tools didn't identify anything interesting in these 2,000 genes. Um, a postdoc in my lab, Scott Zyderdine, um, we basically uh, did some analysis that did identify a mechanism. Basically we used a bigger pathway database, uh, all the pathways that we collect in Pathway Commons and a number of other resources, uh, and uh, a more appropriate statistical test because the data was very sparse. We used a non-competitive test. Um, and. Uh, and it uh, uh, identified a, a, a single mechanism uh, out of all of this data. Um, and that mechanism was targets of a complex called PRC2, or polycomer repressive complex 2. Um, that complex is known to uh, methylate histones, and then DNA gets methylated. Um, this plot shows, uh, shows a, um, the, the, height, the length of this bar corresponds to the significance, the statistical significance of the enrichment, and EED and, and SUS12 are subunits of this PRC2 complex. So all of the gene sets that came out uh, were all pointing to the same mechanism um, and, and being active in, in this uh, serious subgroup. So, um, so that was interesting because um, that was the first mechanism that had basically been uh, identified in this disease. And even more interesting, people have been studying uh, this particular complex. Epigenetics, uh, epigenomics uh, uh, drugs are, are very hot right now, and drug companies are developing drugs against methyltransferases, for instance. Um, there's a methyltransferase in this complex, and there are known chemical probes and drugs uh, developed by various drug companies um, that target this complex. And so Mike, uh, the, the Michael Taylor and, and Peter Dirks, another person uh, involved in the story, uh, were able to test these drugs on uh, patient-derived models, uh, and um, this, these drugs specifically killed these cells, which was great. So first mechanism, interesting drugs, and actually there are on-the-market drugs that uh, target DNA methylation, and one of the patients that came into the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto uh, while the study was going on was a nine-year-old kid who had uh, posterior fossa ependymoma. It had metastasized to the lung. Um, it had doubled in size in two months, um, and um, and basically, it, he, the, stu the, the patient had reached the end stage of the therapy, which means no more treatment options. So on compassionate grounds, they were able to get permission to try an on-the-market anti-DNA methylation drug, 5 uh, azacitidine, um, and that drug in one course of treatment stopped the tumor from growing, and the patient would gain their energy. That lasted for, for 15 months. Um, so that's really amazing. I, I think these, these one, N of 1 uh, predictive uh, studies are more and more common in cancer genomics and hopefully in other diseases. Um, but, uh, but this was interesting for us because we were able to go from um, nothing known about this disease mechanistically, just this anatomical, 100-year-old anatomical uh, definition, to uh, within a few years, within two years approximately, based on a whole bunch of genomics data, mechanism, a drug, and treatment. And now we actually have a, a clinical trial funded for this, uh, this drug um, as part of the Stand Up to Cancer project. Stand Up to Cancer is an American and Canadian now uh, uh, foundation for funding cancer research. I do want to mention um, that uh, because we only found one pathway, that one mechanistic, uh, you know, 
piece that uh, was important in this, in this disease. We were able to trace it back in our database to find out where it came from. It came from uh, Jill Nesrov's MCDB database, and we were able to look up the curators uh, who uh, identified that. Uh, Arthur Lieberzon leads the curation team, and, and Jessica Robertson is the per a person who is attributed to actually typing that data in. It came from one paper. Um, so we can actually go back and tell them, and we did, thank you for reading this paper and putting it in a database because w if you hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have found this. There was no other database that contained this particular information. So it's actually hopefully very motivating for us to uh, say, you know, here's a very specific example that shows that the more data we have in, pa in network and pathway databases, the more, li the more likely we are to make discoveries. And here's an example that is actually benefiting patients right now. Um, okay. so. Uh, I wanted to move to another uh, topic, again, following the theme of genotype to phenotype uh, predictive networks. Um, this is uh, I, an idea that was actually presented by my uh, postdoc, Shraddha Pai, last um, ISMB. Um, we've done some more work in this area now. Um, so Shraddha is leading this effort um, to uh, try to um, use network information and pathway information to predict risk in clinical situations. So risk models uh, aid clinical decision making in, um, in many situations. Uh, there are many famous risk scores that are out there. Uh, for instance, the Framingham Risk Score predicts cardiovascular disease risk, um, and it's been around for a long time. Typically, these risk scores, the ones that are in use in, hosp in actual hospitals in the clinic, um, don't consider genomics data. Um, they do consider, uh, usually they consider lifestyle factors, medical history, and the genetic information usually comes from a question of, about family history. Is this, you know, does anyone in your family have this? And then it's thought to be inherited, and that actually is a huge uh, predictor usually. Um, and, uh, but only a few now are coming out more with, uh, you know, taking information from GWAS studies and other ge genome-wide uh, genome-wide data. So, um, so we'd like to think about a future situation. It might take a, quite a while to get to the stage where um, a patient comes into a hospital. Um, they are, um, where's my pointer here? Um, they, they basically get assessed. Right now, you might say that they're assessed based on a, a history that's taken by a physician and some tests that are done, like a blood test. Um, you might get a heart rate monitor. Um, you might get some imaging done if, you're, if, if, if needed. Um, and increasingly, people are starting to think about genomics and how that fits into this. Um, and obviously, that's going to generate a lot of data. Um, so um, one of the problems with that is how are the physicians going to use this data? So um, you're de definitely going to need computational methods to help work with big data, right? You, the physicians are not going to uh, they don't even learn this yet in medical school, mostly, um, about even genetics, uh, actually. Um, so a, a lot of training and, and anal analysis methods are going to be needed to help uh, clinicians uh, use a lot of data that's going to be available for patients to help them make decisions that can help classify, which means diagnose and prognose, pro uh, uh, develop a prognosis for a patient, and then use that information to um, predict uh, uh, to assign therapy and ideally in the future prevention. It'll be more, um, as we get more data, ideally we'd be able to do more work on prevention. So this is partly inspired by a, um, um, a paper that uh, uh, Nikam Shah actually uh, at Stanford alerted me to when it came out. Um, this is um, uh, basically uh, was published in 2010 in the New England Journal, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the first author was a medical resident uh, who uh, was working in the Stanford Medical Hospital System and uh, had admitted a patient who had a particular disease. Um, and uh, the, there was a complication for this disease that could potentially uh, lead to some risk of thrombosis, like blood clotting. So she was wondering, should she treat this potential risk, even though the patient doesn't have that, but just in case. And she asked all of her senior colleagues, and they basically gave her different answers. So there was no consensus. She couldn't figure out uh, what to do in this particular combination of, of cases. There's no standard of care. So she decided she, she could go to this uh, Stanford Medical Record Database, which is very large, um, and she was actually able to find 98 similar patients, and she found that 10% uh, of them actually developed this thrombosis as a that she was worried about the patient potentially developing. So she decided, yes, we better treat this patient even though they don't, you know, just because they have a risk factor, um, just to avoid this potential problem. And so a four-hour search allowed her to 
make a decision clinically within 24 hours after the patient was admitted. So I really like this idea because she's using a large amount of pa database basically to help make clinical decisions. And it's not frequent that um, physicians actually mine these databases live, um, but they could do it and um, the technology just needs to be developed further. So we've been working on um, uh, something that ideally in the future could help with clinical decision support. We call it NetDX for network based diagnostics, but the idea is that you take all of the data that you have about a, an individual, um, whether it's gene expression data or copy number data, mutation data, prior knowledge, pathways, uh, clinical data like blood test results, family history, um, whatever information you have, and you combine it um, using a framework of uh, patient similarity networks. So we have... Um, um, we're, so we're, we're basically developing a system that can take all of this data, integrate it, and it's a supervised machine learning system. So um, it can uh, basically take patients that, say, are um, known to have a particular um, phenotype, say they respond, uh, you have 100 patients that respond to a drug and 100 patients that don't respond to a drug, and you think, well, it would be nice if I could figure out which patients are going to respond to the drug before I give them the drug, then I could make that decision earlier and it would lead to better effects. So, um, so you use that as a training set with all the data you have and try to predict that, you try to classify those patients, and if you can, then you might be able to use it. So the idea of patient similarity networks is that you represent, um, you create a network uh, where the nodes are patients um, and, or you know, people and the connections are similarities. And there could, you can define infinite number of similarities between people. Um, uh, clinically relevant ones need to be developed. Uh, you could, for instance, relate people uh, by age. If they are closer in age, they get a stronger edge uh, connection. If they're further away in age, they get a weaker connection. Um, if they're smokers uh, or have smoked in their life, they could be all connected in a clique. If they're non-smokers, they're all not connected, or they're all connected in another clique. So you could say have the smoking clique and the non-smoking clique. Now imagine you were trying to predict lung cancer and you didn't know that smoking caused lung cancer. So imagine you had a really strong, it, that was like the, the best variable for that. So um, if you just took the smoking network and the non-smoking network and you overlaid the uh, which patients had lung cancer, the lung cancer would be all over the smoking network, all of the lung cancer patients would be all the, like equal to the smoking network, and so that network would be very useful for predicting lung cancer. So that simple idea is just used over and over again in this, in this, uh, in this tool. Um, so um, one of the interesting things about this patient similarity network idea is that it's privacy friendly, so for people that are actually working with clinical data, you might know that uh, it's difficult sometimes to get access to patient information. Uh, definitely you don't want to ever see someone's name or birth date or phone number, but even genetic data obviously is, is uh, even though it's not all protected in every country, um, we know ethically that it can be used to identify individuals. And you know, if, I, if there was a way that I didn't need to actually see that data, it would be better for me because then I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, um, you know, accidentally doing something that identifies somebody. So, um, like leaking data online, if a graduate student has a laptop, loses a laptop. So, um, so uh, a lot of people are thinking about privacy-friendly uh, systems. Um, uh, we haven't proven this, but the pa just conceptually, patient similarity networks should be privacy-friendly. If you don't want to share your data with me, but I can tell you, I can give you some code to compute similarity networks based on the data that you have, and you share just the similarity networks, I can do all my computation based on those without ever seeing the genomic data, although presumably you might want to go back to it to understand, um, to explain certain things if you're interested in specific uh, mutations. But that's the general idea. Okay, so um, we've tried this out. Uh, we're still working on it. There's a paper in BioArchive that's been there for a while, and we're still working on. Uh, uh, we got some good feedback um, from that, and uh, we're readying a f a f a another version of that. Uh, but we have tried it in a number of different uh, cases. Um, in one, we tried it on uh, autism spectrum disorder. So autism is a de neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, it has, um, you know. Uh, uh, an important incidence in the population, mostly affects males. Uh, there are, pheno the phenotype includes social impairment, repetitive movements, restricted interests, um, uh, but there's actually a wide range of phenotypes and people who study this know that it's probably there's different subtypes, but we don't know what those subtypes are. So it's a heterogeneous disease, which is problematic. Um, 
The, um, but that's all we, we have. Um, we, we know that it's diagnosed based on clinical uh, criteria. These clinical criteria are used, you know, basically a, 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 a kid usually comes in and a, a, a bunch of tests are administered. Usually they're tests that are geared towards like three or four year old kids, like play with toys, look at soap bubbles, do they laugh? Do they line the toys up? How they how do they deal with it? It's not. It doesn't. Whenever I see these things, I I, I think couldn't there be more specific phenotypes for measuring this? But they don't have any. They're, they they don't have neural. Uh, they don't have brain imaging or anything that kind of identifies us. So they just use these kind of social tests, and um, and uh, and so that diagnosis obviously can't happen until the patient the, per, the kid can play with toys, for instance. So um, if we, we know that there's a big genetic component, uh, at least 50%, but uh, estimates range up to 60%, uh, 80% in twin studies um, for uh, um, inherited comp uh, genetic uh, components of this disease. Uh, and so um, it would be nice to be able to develop a genetic classifier that would allow earlier clinical monitoring. Um, a colleague, Steve Scherer in Toronto, studies this and has determined that copy number variants, especially gene deletions, play a big role um, and, um, and that they actually affect pathways. We, we worked uh, a number of years ago on a project where we did a pathway analysis, we performed pathway analysis on a copy number, um, autism associated copy number data set and identified all sorts of interesting pathways including um, central nervous system development uh, pathways that are viewed in this enrichment map here. Um, so people had sort of tried to use this, uh, people mostly on the team actually uh, that were, were working in this uh, study, they, they tried to use this pathway information to see if they could predict autism and they didn't do very well. Um, we uh, tried to use NetDX and the way we did this is we made pathway based similarity networks. So patients were related if they had deletions, gene deletions in the same pathway. So there's a Wnt pathway, um, if patients get connected, if, there's any if they have any deletion uh, in any gene in the Wnt pathway. You can define that in different ways. Um, you can imagine uh, having different pathway networks, uh, if you, ones that are enriched in cases, one that are enriched, uh, sorry, one, uh, ones that are enriched in controls and one that are mixed. The ones that are enriched in controls or cases are more predictive for cases or controls. Um, and um, uh, we can put all of those networks, hundreds or thousands of those networks into uh, a machine learning algorithm that we, that we uh, are using um, to do network-based um, machine learning, uh, basically network-based int uh, data integration. We actually use the same machine learning algorithm that's used in the gene mania gene function prediction method, uh, which does the same thing for, it, it, it combines networks of gene relationships to predict gene function. Here we're, we're using it for patients um, and uh, to predict, um, given a set of patients, can you find pati more patients like that? So in general, the machine learning method is supervised, you give it a training set, but it's a uh, learning to rank machine learning method, so it, it, it's one class classification, so it's it, uh, given a set of not like, you know, respond patients that respond to a drug, predict other patients that respond to a drug, given another pa set of patients that don't respond to a drug, predict other ones. And so if you want to use that for classification, you have to do it both ways and see which patient is closer to, you know, if a new patient comes in, if they're closer to um, one class or another, um, ranked higher uh, by the method. Um, we did just for people who are interested in the technical details, uh, it turned out that we had to uh, filter um, uh, data that is um, was randomly uh, networks that might have randomly been um, strongly case enriched or control enriched. Uh, it would happen by chance at some level, so we identified that with resampling and removed those, and that was important. Um, the end. Um, we just to explain a few more of the details. Um, basically, we we. Uh, um, measure the performance by doing tenfold cross-validation uh, where we hold out, uh, you know, we train with 90%, hold out 10, try to predict um, cases, for instance, and we, um, out of all these rounds, we also identify the networks that are ranked highly. One of the features of the Gene Mania algorithm is that it provides, uh, does feature selection, so it identifies the networks that are most um, correlated with the class that you're looking at. Um, those are networks like the smoking lung cancer network that I mentioned. Um, networks that don't connect patients at all of the class are rated uh, low. Um, and so it uses that scoring system to identify networks that are predictive and we identify those. 
um, and count them up. We do two, two levels of cross-validation. So, uh, so we, ha we um, uh, to try to reduce the chances of overfitting, although we can't guarantee that. Um, and uh, in the end, we get a, a score of uh, a set of variables that are predictive, in this case of autism. Um, it turns out that um, this is a bit of a messy plot that I always promised to myself to fix. Um, but in general, uh, our best predictor was this red line. Um, so it's, it's, it's this, uh, you know, um, this plot shows that it's doing better than chance, doing better than previous methods. Um, filtering is important. But in general, um, we don't do, you know, as, w as uh, we don't get anywhere near to where this could be used right away as a clinical tool. But, uh, but it's interesting because it does show that, it, that there's some information about pathways that could be uh, useful. And presumably, working more on this problem and integrating different data could identify um, ways of pushing this curve up um, over time. So an important aspect of what we're doing is um, uh, developing a, a software system that can help with all of these performance analyses. And then you could track that over time. Um, the second Another interesting thing is that the pathways that are identified as predictive, um, uh, we, can, we can look at them, and uh, we get pathways in this case of um, synaptic transmission, uh, wind signaling. These are pathways that are known to be associated with the phenotype, so that helps us gain confidence in the results uh, in general. Um, usually when we, when we do this analysis, we often get pathways that are biologically related to the phenotype that we're studying. So those pathways might not be super predictive by themselves, but they represent some predictive value, uh, and also they represent interesting biology, and so we can start understanding more about mechanisms potentially from this. So there's kind of two dual goals here. One is trying to predict something about patients, eventually for use in the clinic, but that's a hard problem. Um, in the meantime, we can also get information about m by, uh, mechanism. Um, we've tried this with breast cancer subtyping, so predicting luminal A subtype. Um, uh, again, using, in this case, pathways plus gene expression and copy number variant data. Um, in the end, um, we also get uh, a set of pathways that are, um, uh, you know, I don't have the performance here, I think, but um, we get a, a, a set of pathways that are, again, um, known to be involved in uh, breast cancer, more cancer-related pathways. These pathways come, uh, are actually, found in both the expression mostly and some from the copy number variant data. So you can, this illustrates that we can integrate different types of data and merge them to, to, to get a, a combined view. Um, we can also look at the patient similarity network that is uh, a combined result of all of the pathways or features that we've identified. And so here, this is another test of whether the method is working. We can basically see clustering of these orange dots, which are the, the class that we were trying to predict. So these, based on the, the learned networks that are most informative for this class. Um, once you combine them and visualize them, lay them out using a standard force-directed layout algorithm, you can um, see that they're clustered, and, uh, and so that's a good sign, um, we w and you can quantify that. Uh, we've compared with other methods, uh, with data that's out there. There's a nice paper by uh, Yuan et al. in Nature Biotech where they tried to predict survival based on all the cancer genomics data that they had available. They took four, they chose four cancer genomics data sets from the TCGA that had lots of different type of data, clinical RNA, microRNA, et cetera. Um, so um, these, uh, it, we were able to do better than this method. Um, the, actually, they tried dozens and dozens of machine learning methods and classification systems in this paper. Um, for kidney cancer, we were able to do better when we used pathway information. Um, we uh, both, nobody has been able to do better for glioblastoma and ovarian based on the genomics data. Um, and lung cancer, we didn't do as well. Um, so it's not always, we're not claiming that this is the best machine learning algorithm, but um, we're mo mostly thinking about a framework. Uh, but it does illustrate a few things that you get very different results depending on the data that you look at. Um, for, pa for kidney cancer, pathways seems to be really important. They didn't use that in their previous paper. Um, some cancers, there's really no information that people can find in the genomics data. One of the interesting things about kidney cancer is that actually we could get a much better result if we just used simple clinical data of age, stage, and grade. Um, stage and grade usually relate to metastasis, um, and that's known to be serious. So actually, you didn't need all the clinical, all the, all the genomics data that we spent a lot of money on. Uh, it could have just done survival prediction based on 
um, on those simple factors like the age and you know, whether the patient had metat metastatic disease. Um, and clinicians know this. Of course, that's not the whole story with genomics data. We also learn about pathways in this case and a lot of information about mechanisms, and that can lead to new drugs, as I illustrated actually happens with the case that I showed you with the penomoma. So these are pathways that are predictive of good survival and bad survival in kidney cancer, and uh, we cross-checked this with previously known pathways linked to kidney cancer, and many of them were, were known, so that's interesting. So what we'd like to build is a framework where you can put in different types of data, use this, uh, this system that I explained, um, but actually uh, for a clinician, a clin or mostly a clinical researcher uh, who is not a machine learning expert, um, to try and automate a lot of tests uh, to first answer the question, can this, uh, you know, if I have patients that are different and I want to be able to classify them, can I classify them using the data that I have? And you should be able to get an answer, yes or no. Um, uh, yes, I can classify these with some value, or no, there's no way that I can see in this data that I can classify this using the framework that we're using here. Um, so we'd like to have some kind of checklist. Uh, so for instance, the pathways that we identify, are they consistent with prior knowledge about the disease? That's good. Is it better than random? So we can run various random controls. We can see if it's better than random. Do individual um, pathway networks actually correlate with the phenotype? What's the effect size, uh, say, and, and you can look at the um, clustering as well in the patient similarity network. Do they cluster apart? Do the classes cluster apart? Uh, does the, uh, you know, can, can you use this to predict outcome or, or you know, how, what, you know how, how good are you at predicting this? And so, for instance, for our four cancers that we studied, um, the, uh, um, kidney cancer is the only one that survives those, uh, those, that checklist, and so we would say we are not able to do anything with the other three. So it's nice to know that and have something that tries to automate uh, that and provide a report. So that's the idea that we will eventually um, are, are building. So we have an R package that will be released when the paper is published, um, but we're happy to share it if people are interested collaboratively because we're still developing and we'd like to get feedback on it. Um, um, okay, so that's, that's predictive networks. So it's patient similarity networks. Um, nodes are patients, edges are similarities, um, and, and what you can do with this. People are also developing unsupervised methods. Uh, there's a nice method by Anna Goldenberg called similarity network fusion that does this, uses the same paradigm but uh, is, is for unsupervised clustering. And other people that, like uh, uh, Joel Dudley have published some papers about that as well. Um, okay, so back to the general concept of genotype to phenotype. Um, uh, we can, you know, I think everyone in this room is somehow involved in thinking this way, um, but one of the things that we all know is important is data. So um, it's nice to be able to access the, all of the data that we need about cellular mechanism. Uh, and so um, we're happy to be involved in a community that's, gener that's collecting this data. We're, my group is not involved in any curation tasks. And so we really depend on curators, like the example that I mentioned, where we couldn't have made a discovery without a curator. So. Um, uh, to help us uh, collect data and develop technology to do that. Uh, Chris Sander, Emek Demir, Augustin Luna is here, uh, uh, have been working for a number of years on Pathway Commons. Um, I'll be at that poster, 8236, uh, after this, so I'm happy to talk generally about anything uh, related to this. But Pathway Commons um, has uh, basically collects data in standard formats, PSIMI or Biopacks, which we developed for, to help integrate pathway information, um, and currently has 22 databases, 1.3 million interactions, mostly focused on human, uh, and a whole bunch of interesting apps and tools. We just released a new version. One of the things that we're making progress on is completely automated pathway layout. So if you have pathway information uh, and, um, you know, it's been a little bit challenging to lay out pathway information. Network layout is okay up to a certain point beyond the hairball limit, um, but pathway information has been more challenging to organize um, because it's hierarchical, for instance. You have um, reactions uh, also that are not binary, um, and, uh, but we now actually have automatic layout algorithms that are implemented in Cytoscape.js, um, and we're using the systems biology graphical notation uh, to visualize the, the pathway symbols, uh, the molecule symbols, and their interactions. Um, visualize molecules and interactions with specific symbols. Um, and so this is actually fully laid, uh, laid out automatically. It's not perfect, but it's getting a lot better. This is work with Ur Dagrazaz uh, um, and, and Ken Sapur at, uh, in uh, Ankara, Turkey. They developed the, the layout algorithm. We developed Cytoscape.js that's 
on top of that is underlying this, and we implemented this app. Uh, uh, Dylan Fong and Jeff Long and uh, Manfred Chung uh, did that. Um, so Pathway Commons, um, uh, after many years of development, includes a number of different types of technologies um, uh, that are shared. They're all open access. Uh, we're still working on this, but one of the things that we'd like to do is work with others to, as much as possible, to uh, basically create a community of technologies that can help everybody do their work faster, ideally. Um, I've definitely seen that it took us a long time to, for instance, our group at least, it took us a long time to build these technologies, but it's now faster and faster for us to build apps that actually use the technologies to do visualization or analysis, um, and I think that's just gonna speed up. And the more technologies that people co coordinate on and contribute it openly and uh, with standard, uh, um, use of standards, et cetera, uh, the easier it will be for everyone to build these, these systems and focus on discovery um, more than technology development. Um, the last thing I wanted to uh, advertise was um, the Human Reference Interactome project that is uh, started by Mark Vidal and uh, David Hill and, um, and others in, in their group at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Um, have been uh, developing over a number of years. Uh, the interesting thing for this community is that they recently started, uh, so they're doing an amazing high throughput human interactome screen with many, many different types of yeast 2 hybrid validated in many different ways. Um, all the old things about yeast 2 hybrid having a high false positive rate don't mat don't, are not relevant anymore because of all the controls and repetitions that they do and all the study that they've done and how that works. Um, so um, they, uh, the interesting thing is that they are releasing all of their data pre-publication now, updating it and putting it in intact uh, um, and the IMAX databases every six months. You can get it from interactome.baderlab.org and also the DH DFCI site, but if you type this number into intact, you'll actually get, a, get the, the data as well, pre-publication. It's not easy to find because um, you don't have a publication to search on. But okay, so I'd like to um, acknowledge, I acknowledge the number of people along the way um, uh, uh, and generally acknowledge uh, people in my lab um, uh, didn't talk about all the different projects that we have, um, but uh, uh, they do all the work and very appreciative of, of their uh, efforts and, and excitement and enthusiasm. Thank you very much for, for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, Eve? Yeah. Yeah, it's possible that um, you can, so that's an important problem uh, that exists for all machine learning tasks and definitely in, pre in precision medicine. Um, uh, if, you, if you don't consider subtypes and you put in a bunch of things, mach any machine learning or classification system will have trouble uh, predicting outcome because you have a mixture. Yeah. Uh, if you don't recognize that mixture, then you might do poorly. Uh, so it's possible that that's the reason. I think that autism is, and a lot of mental uh, health and neurodevelopmental diseases are plagued by that because they actually don't know subtypes. When you do know subtypes, if you, if you can identify them by clustering or by knowledge, then you usually do better. So I didn't, I didn't, we didn't really consider that too much. Um, it's a good point, and so we can actually go back and test it. The only pro I guess the only problem, actually, I think the reason why we didn't do that is because then you get to too few patients and you can't, run the method well, the yeah the yeah so, so I it's a good question I don't know for that data set what the numbers are for that subclass um, and and yeah we have and we that was the one I pr I mentioned with luminal a which was the most common subtype so we just tried that one but you know there are f different classes and you can treat one each one independently yeah any other Questions? Yes?
So the question is, um, you know, rare diseases, you don't have a lot of individuals, can these methods be used for that? I think the machine learning method does need a certain number of individuals and it's probably on the order of at least like close to 100. Um, you might have that many individuals with rare diseases, um, but um, you know, in general, the, the general idea with rare diseases, if you have, um, well, some rare diseases are really just about one gene, um, in which case you could recognize that um, through family studies, for, for instance. Uh, that's how most of those genes are identified. Um, if you don't, if you can't identify a gene um, or a mutation through, through standard techniques like that, and you think it might be a pathway-related disease and not really Mendelian, um, then pathway information is the, and, or network information is the best um, way of, in my mind, of, of improving statistical power. Uh, so all the, uh, you, have, you might have 10 individuals with a rare disease, but they're all the, and they all have different mutations, but they, uh, those mutations all affect the same complex or pathway, um, even though they affect different genes. So if that happens, then that's a good way of using that prior knowledge to uh, amplify power. Um, but um, that's, and you know, that's my answer. Other than that, it's difficult. Uh, I guess um, I do have colleagues that are working in that problem, and one of the, um, what, like Mike Brudno is developing a uh, phenotype central or phenome central system, and their goal is to actually connect rare disease patients around the world so uh, people can be matched by patient phenotype similarity and they might identify others that have that same disease. And actually they've already used it and have identified m people. So you can also branch out across the whole world if possible eventually, but we're not working in that specific area. That's more of a social network um, genetics, clinical genetics project, but people are working in that as well. I don't know what the time is, but. <laughs>